everyone. everyone. As promised, here we are delivering histology content for the semester. We know that you haven't had a face-to-face -face session, so we thought this would be a really effective, succinct way for you to get ready for the exam. Okay, so what systems are we going to cover, Daniela? So relevant to the content that you've covered elsewhere, we will be going through the endocrine system, looking at the thyroid, parathyroid, some of the pancreas and a bit of the pituitary. And my personal favourite, we're going to talk about the nervous system because you've had quite a few cases on that this semester. We will finish off looking at some of the aspects of the renal system. And then we're just going to touch a little bit about the liver um, because you have had that session on liver last semester. So go back to that yes. lecture recording if you need to, but we'll go through that briefly anyway. So just before we finish up, of course, we'd love to hear back from you. Yes. Both of us will be available to you during the exam revision period to clarify any aspects of this or if you need a face-to-face -face session, we're more than happy to be there. So we welcome all of your feedback. Absolutely. So let's get stuck into it. Let's get into it. So looking at the endocrine system, let's start with the parathyroid glands. These four glands sit behind the thyroid in the neck region and generally they're a size of a rice grain. The main function of the parathyroid glands is to make and secrete parathyroid hormone and most of you should know by now that the main function of the parathyroid hormone is to regulate blood calcium levels. So for example if a low concentration of calcium is detected in blood this will result in an increase in production and secretion of PTH to increase calcium concentration via a plethora of mechanisms. One of the main things that we want you to be able to do is to distinguish the thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland histologically. So people often get these glands confused anatomically, but histologically there's a really clear distinct difference in, in terms of appearance. If we looked at the thyroid gland, we can see here that they are filled with these structures that look like follicles and they're termed thyroid follicles. Thyroid follicles essentially release T3 and T4 hormones which enable us to regulate our metabolism. We're not going to talk about them too much uh, in this review session but we're going to focus instead on the parathyroid gland. With the parathyroid gland we have uh, two populations of cells that are clearly different from each other. We have the parathyroid cells uh, if you're looking at this low mag section of the parathyroid, can you please take me through the features that you're identifying? So as I mentioned before, with the parathyroid uh, sections, you usually have two distinct populations of cells. Over here down the bottom, we have a really pinkish population of cells, and they're called the oxophil cells. What is the function of those, do you know? So oxophil cells are not secretory in function, that much we do know, but we don't actually know what the real purpose is in the parathyroid gland, so for your purposes, you don't need to know that either. So let me now tell you about the other population of cells that you are predominant in this histological section and in most histological sections of the parathyroid that you'll see, and these are called the principal or the chief cells. Really easy to distinguish between oxophil and principal cells because the majority of the cells present will be the principal cells. These cells are different in appearance. Obviously, you don't see that they you see that they do not have an eosinophilic cytoplasm. And whilst their nuclei are clearly um, similar to that of the oxyphil cells, they do hold a different function. And these are the cells that are responsible for the secretion and the making of the parathyroid hormone. Now we'll move into an image where, of high magnification where some of these features will be more distinct. So Vithya, if I asked you a question based on these two images where I inquired about you relating the histological appearance of different cells of the parathyroid to their function, what would you be able to tell me? I think I'd focus, immediate, focus immediately on the two populations of cells. So on the right here we have the oxyphil cells and in the oxyphil cells, they clearly have a very pinkish cytoplasmic appearance. So that's what we're looking for. These cells are really large, as you can tell by the boundaries of them, and they usually occur in clusters in parathyroid tissue sections. Now, these guys have lots of mitochondria in them. We don't really know why, but they do, and that is characteristic um, for the pinkish appearance that we see. Flip side to that, we have our chief cells or our principal cells, and these are really important for you guys to remember, mainly because they synthesize and secrete parathyroid hormone. 
So these cells, unlike the oxyphil cells, aren't as large, but they do have a clear distinct nuclei and that gives it its purple um, appearance. Continuing on with the endocrine system, let's look at the pancreas now. The pancreas is a large 15 centimeter long organ positioned in the upper left part of the abdomen, sitting behind the stomach. So you should all know this, but even looking at it histologically, it's clear that there are two distinct cellular population present in the pancreas, which is characteristic of the two roles that the pancreas holds, the exocrine and the endocrine role. I will start talking about the exocrine role and the majority of the cells that you see here are termed pancreatic sini and these are the ones responsible for the digestive role that the pancreas plays. So these cells within their cytoplasm contain zymogens or granules that are full of pancreatic juices or digestive enzymes that upon stimulation are secreted via a duct to break down carbohydrates, proteins and lipids in chyme. Hang on, Daniela. How do you know that that's a duct, though? That's great, Vithya. Why don't you tell us about those features? So we've got these epithelial cells that are lining a duct, and that's characteristic of any duct in any part of the body. So that's how you would identify that that's essentially a duct. Thank you. Moving on from the exocrine part of the pancreas, let's talk a bit about these very specific looking islands of cells that look very different to the surrounding pancreatic acini. So the islets of Langerhans or these islands of cells are clusters of cells that serve the endocrine function of the pancreas. So because it's the endocrine function of the pancreas, we absolutely need blood vessels to be really closely associated with the, within these cells. As we can see in this section, they're all located around here and here as well. So in terms of the function of the cells that are present in the islets of Langerhans, these may can secrete two really important hormones, insulin and glucagon, which are critical to maintenance and regulation of glucose levels in our blood. What isn't obvious in this section, and probably you never will be able to make this distinction in a H&E stain, is there are two types of cells present in there, alpha and beta, which secrete glucagon and insulin respectively. So now we will move on to another slide that represents these cells. Just... So here we have a different image of the pancreas at a high magnification. So Vith, can you please take us through what the pancreas does functionally in terms of its histology. So again, just to reiterate, we've got the two separate uh, distinct groups of cells. We've got the acini cells, and these are the cells that serve the exocrine function. That's all about producing pancreatic juices to be contributed to the digestive system. More so what we want you to focus on are these islets of Langerhan cells, and these are the cells that produce insulin and glucagon, along with other hormones as well. So other than just producing these two hormones and others, they also indirectly regulate accumulation of toxic substances such as ketones in our body. So very important in this process. And if anyone's wondering what these cells are, these are actually cells that make up fat tissue or adipose tissue. Looking at the pituitary here, Vithya, are you able to, even looking at an anatomical image of a pituitary gland, what are the distinct features that are clearly identifiable upon seeing it? So with the pituitary gland, it's important to remember that it works in association with the hypothalamus that sits just above it. Together they form the hypothalamus pituitary gland axis or endocrine axis to regulate hormone secretion and production. We have two distinct lobes of the pituitary gland. We have the anterior pituitary gland and the posterior pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland arises from epithelial glandular tissue and therefore characteristically looks like epithelial cells. The posterior pituitary gland comes from nervous system tissue, but don't panic because we're going to go through a few images of what neural tissue looks like and that will make you feel a little bit better about this. Let's recap on the information that you've just given, looking at the pituitary with the histological view. So over here, we have the entire pituitary gland that we can see. 
The pituitary the anterior pituitary gland on the left is also abbreviated as PD because it's also called the pars distalis. And the posterior pituitary gland on the right is also abbreviated as PN because it's also called the pars nervosa. Again, this reflects the origin of or the originating tissue. We can distinctly tell that there are two different subsets of populations and, and populations of cells purely by their colour, with the pars distalis having a more basophilic appearance compared to the pars nervosa tissue. Keeping in mind that the hypothalamus produces two hormones that are then stored in the posterior pituitary gland, these hormones are ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, and oxytocin. These are the only two hormones associated with the posterior pituitary gland. Over with the anterior pituitary gland, we've got quite a few hormones that are associated with them. Some examples are LH, luteinizing hormone, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. What's also important for you to take away is that we don't expect you to be able to identify the individual cell types seen here. So this is non-examinable material, but the images are there to correspond with what you can see in the low magnification images. So here we're looking at spinal cord sections. This is slow magnification and what we're trying to describe to you is the meninges and the spaces that surround the spinal cord. So the meninges and the spaces apply to both the brain and the spinal cord and we start off over here in the spinal cord section by pointing at the dura and that is labelled A for your reference as well. So the dura as the outermost toughest layer needs to be made up of dense connective tissue and that's mostly consisting collagen and that's why it appears really light, uh, darkly intensely staining pink. Followed by that we have the second layer that's called the arachnoid mater and that instantly tells you if you know Latin <laughs> that it is a spidery inner layer and it's often a layer that's hard to make out in post-mortem tissue. After that, we've got the final layer, which is the innermost layer, and that is called the pia mater. Now, the pia mater is the innermost and most intimate layer, and it actually follows the grooves and the folds of both the brain and the spinal cord. So essentially, in a real person in, that's alive, the space that you can see between the spinal cord and the pia mater would not exist. So it should be intact, but it's just an artificial space that we can see that's come out as a result of tissue processing. So here we have illustrations of both the brain and the spinal cord. Now these images are here purely for you to refer back to um, so that you can understand where the meninges and the spaces are associated with both the brain and the spinal cord but you probably already have seen these images in your anatomy lectures. On the left, bottom left, we can see another representative of images highlighting the spaces and that's what we're going to talk about in focus of this histological image that we can see on the right. So we start off with the outermost layer, dense layer that we can see that's known as the dura mater. Now the dura mater is that dense outermost connective tissue layer and just above dura mater is where we'll find the actual skull periosteal tissue which we don't see in this image. Just beneath the dura we have the subdural space. It's called the subdural space because it's sub or below the dura itself. After which we have the arachnoid mater that we can see labelled A here. The arachnoid mater is that second layer and often it's, it's hard to distinguish out and at times the people or textbooks will refer to the arachnoid and the pia mater together as the leptomeninges. Just below the arachnoid mater we have the subarachnoid space. So I hope you guys are seeing a trend here, subdural, subarachnoid, all spaces. And then we have 
within the subarachnoid space really important features such as blood vessels. Now, the subarachnoid space is a real space that we find in live human beings, unlike the subdural space, which is known as a potential space. What this means is that the subdural space is one of the key spaces in which we can easily get hemorrhages. Um, the last layer that we have is the pia mater that we can see here. And that, as you know by now, is the innermost layer that will be closely associated with the um, brain and spinal cord tissue. As you can see here, it's we've got white matter underlying it. So just in case you guys didn't believe me that these spaces exist, I have an electron microscope image that we have on the left. And here we can see the dura mater and just underlying the dura mater, we have this black hole that is the subdural space. Beneath the subdural space, we have that meningeal layer called the arachnoid. And just below the arachnoid mater, we have the subarachnoid space. Again, I have to reiterate the subdural space is a potential space, which means it doesn't actually exist in real life unless you have an hemorrhage dissecting into it, as opposed to the subarachnoid space, which is where we have cerebrospinal fluid flowing through and we also find blood vessels. So on the right here, we have a histological image of just mainly the subarachnoid space. And again, this is to reiterate that this is where you're gonna find, yep, blood vessels and also nerve bundles as well. Vithya, you've just mentioned hemorrhaging, so can you please tell me what different types of brain hemorrhage there are and how they relate to the spaces that you've just discussed? So you guys are probably more familiar with this because you have had actual cases on hemorrhages. The two main types of hemorrhages I'm going to just talk about briefly are subdural and subarachnoid hemorrhages. Again, subdural hemorrhages are found just below the dura in the potential space. It's usually caused by a rupture of bridging veins um, and it's really that these veins are vulnerable uh, purely because of where they're located um, they're vulnerable to sheer injury and the veins are located between from as they cross from the arachnoid into the dura so clinically you get that crescent shaped hematoma as venous blood easily dissects Subarachnoid hemorrhages are usually caused by both non-traumatic and traumatic causes. Non-traumatic causes are arterial aneurysms um, as opposed to traumatic causes such as cerebral contusions both of those usually pre uh, present with spontaneous headaches Vithya, here we've got two different histological stains, so can you please take us through these sections? Yep, so on the top panel we have a silver stain, whereas in the bottom images obviously they've been stained with H&E. If we just look at the top image here, we've got a section of the lumbar spinal cord, and here we can see that beautiful butterfly shape in the middle of the spinal cord. That's reflective of the grey matter, and just everywhere else around that butterfly shape, we have white matter tracks. So going back to the images on the bottom, on the left image, we have grey matter, and the right image corresponds with white matter. If we start with the grey matter, we can see these neurons, that's what the N stands for, and they're obviously the cell bodies that make up the grey matter, hence it has that um, grey matter appearance. Contrary to that, we've got the image on the right, and the T in this image stands for axonal tracks or tracks, and that's because we have lots of axons within these regions, and it's the myelin that sits around the axons that gives white matter its white appearance. So here we have two images that will show you the distinction between the grey matter and the white matter really clearly. At these boundaries, we have grey matter on the top and white matter on the bottom, and that corresponds to the structures that we expect to see in it. So in the grey matter, we're expecting to find glial cells and also neurons, compared to the white matter, where we're expecting to see glial cells, as displayed by these purple nuclei, and also the A in this image stands for axons. So in the case of axons in the white matter, again, the white matter comes from the myelin that surrounds some of the axons. 
It's important for you to re recognize that in this case, the purple nuclei that we can see here corresponds to the axon and the white blob that we can see around it is essentially the myelin sheath. Here we have two more sections of white matter, both of which have been stained with H&E. So we can see lots of axons here and that's all we want you to be able to take away from these images. But on the bottom here we have the osmium tetroxide staining that we've used to stain up myelinated axons. So it is, we've got a little bit of a section from spinal cord and again it is white matter, but X corresponds to myelinated axons. So the black dark rings that we see are basically the myelin sheath that's surrounding the axon. So Vithya, we don't want a single student in this cohort to get this wrong. Repeat it for me. In the CNS, what are the myelin producing cells? So the myelin producing cells are oligodendrocytes. In the PNS, what is their equivalent? So in the peripheral nervous system, the myelin producing cells are known as Schwann cells. So how do we know that one of these images is from the central nervous system and not the peripheral nervous system? Because we have an image of the spinal cord here and that's obviously the central nervous system. So on the left here we have another H&E image of grey matter this time and on the right it's a silver stain but also of grey matter. So if we go to the H&E image of grey matter we can clearly see that this is a neuronal cell body and obviously these are really large cells compared to the surrounding glial cells. On the right here we have the same grey matter image except this time it's been stained up with a silver stain. So we can clearly still see the neuronal cell profiles, the cell bodies all around this image, except in this case the, they look or they're appearing a little bit different. And the reason for the difference in the appearance or the colour is because they are filled with a molecule that's known as, or molecules known as melanin or neuromelanin. Now the thing about these neurons is that they are producing lots of neuromelanin to then be made into dopamine. And dopamine is released in the basal ganglia for coordination of movements. So essentially that means that these are neurons, or this is a high power image of the substantia nigra. So what is the significance of this functionally, Vithya? Well, in Parkinson's disease, it's these neurons that degenerate and therefore dopamine synthesis ceases, so we lose pigmentation, but more importantly, functionally, it presents as a movement disorder. Let's talk about the liver a little bit. So it's a gland that holds multiple critical roles to the functioning of the body. It regulates glycogen storage, is involved in decomp decomposition of red blood cells, synthesizes multiple factors including plasma proteins, carbs, cholesterol, bile, phospholipids, and produces hormones. It plays a major role in detoxification of our entire body, and also the bioproduction part of it um, gives it uh, the title of being an accessory organ to the digestive system. So looking at the histology images here on the right of liver, what I see um, is a uniform structure which represents its cellular compartment. Most of the cells here that you see are hepatocytes, about 70 to 80% um, of, liver, um, of liver cytoplasmic mass is made up of these cells. They contain a large amount of rough endoplasmic reticulum and some ribosomes in there, so the nuclei are purple, the cytoplasmic staining is not overly eosinophilic but it maintains that um, pale purple staining. Other than the hepatocytes, Beth, can you please comment on what else one would come across looking at a histological section of liver? Yep, 
So you need to also focus on the actual structures that we can see, uh, not just at a cellular level. So starting off, we have a central vein that we can see that's located here. And obviously, the if you go back to our um, review lecture that we gave last semester as well, we talked about the radiating strands of hepatocytes that always lead out of the central vein and into the central vein. Um, following which, and that's what the H stands for, guys, if you're wondering, hepatocytes. And in terms of actual structures, we have three main ones that we always want you to focus on when, with regards to talking about the portal triad. So we start off with PV over here, and that is the portal vein. And then we have the hepatic artery, followed by what's known as the bile duct, and that's just located here. Now, most of you are probably sitting there wondering, how do we how do we tell these structures apart? Well, with the portal veins or any veins for that fact, you're always looking for a thinner wall compared to what we see as a hepatic artery or in any artery. So with the artery, we can actually see that it's, a, it's got a lot more pink staining and that's because of a thicker wall compared to the portal vein. Bile ducts, on the other hand, are really distinguishable purely because they're a duct and therefore they have some form of glandular epithelial cells lining them and that's what we can see in in that region over here. So Vithya, can you please recap on those features just now looking at a different image of liver? Yep, so we start off again with this huge structure that we can see here and that is the portal vein. For those of you that are wondering how I figure that out, again we're looking for that really thin lining around it. More importantly, this one's probably a giveaway because we've got lots of red blood cells located in the lumen of that blood vessel as well. An additional feature to look for is the um, simple squamous cells that actually line the portal vein and it has that sort of squished lengthened appearance purely because it's a portal vein and therefore it often collapses as well. Over here we have the hepatic artery um, and you can see that by the fact that it has a thicker lining and it's a little bit stains up a little bit redder as well um, and that's how you distinguish the artery from the vein. Finally we've got a really pretty bile duct that's located here and we know that it's a bile duct because it's got it's being lined by glandular epithelial cells in this case they look cuboidal and this is where they are. Okay, so with when I think of bile and liver, I often do think of jaundice. Can you tell me how this relates functionally to the image that we're looking at? Yep, so one of the most important features of the liver is that it breaks down red blood cells that are dysfunctional or not used anymore. And with red blood cell breakdown, we get uh, bilirubin as a byproduct, which then goes into bile. What happens when these bile ducts are obstructed or we get biliary obstruction is that we get buildup of bile within our blood and that causes jaundice. Thank you. So over the last two slides, we've given you two images that we haven't focused on or labelled, and they're merely for you to practice on and see how similar things or same things can appear differently across different histological images. Let's recap on some of the basic points about the urinary system before we take you through the histology of it because you did cover this in your second year in the second semester. Looking at the kidneys, which are the main organ of the urinary system, you do remember that we do have three distinct regions. We have the cortex, the medulla and the renal pelvis. In the cortex is where the functional unit of the kidney and of the urinary system Sits. So this is nephron responsible for pretty much the three major functions of the urinary system being the filtration of plasma, reabsorption of nutrients and water back into blood and excretion of waste termed as urine. Let's look at the image on the left to remind ourselves of all of the components of the nephron. So we've got the renal corpuscle, which is made up from the glomerulus, the tuft of capillaries and the Bowman's capsule, which encapsulates the filtrate, which then moves on to the proximal convoluted tubule, traveling through the loop of Henle, back up the distal convoluted tubule, 
where then the urine is excreted through the collecting duct into the renal pelvis and through the ureters out into the bladder. So Vithia, let's now relate this to the image on the right. Let's look at the nephron histologically and tell me what you can see over here. So to start with, we've got that really nice ball of capillaries that's called the glomerulus and surrounding it we have the Bowman's capsule. Collectively, they make up the renal corpuscle. The glomerulus or the uh, ball of capillaries brings in the blood plasma that we need to filter out. Once we've filtered that blood plasma, the filtrate now enters this white space that we can see here called the urinary space. Once filtrate is in the urinary space, it then proceeds to the first bit of the renal tubules called the PCT or the proximal convoluted tubule. So in this image, we can see really pretty uh, uh, reflections or illustrations of the PCT. And the PCT cells stain up really eosinophilic or acidophilic purely because they have lots of enzymes in them to be able to process all of the material that they reabsorb. PCT cells also have lots of mitochondria in them, which also gives it that characteristic dark pink appearance. On the flip side to this, we have some a few DCT sections that we can see here and here. And comparatively, if you look at the PCT cells, the DCT cells appear to be a lot lighter inside a plasmic staining. The reason being they don't absorb as much material compared to the PCT and therefore don't need as many enzymes and therefore do not appear as pink. Hey, Mitch has had enough of us. He's facing away. Vithya, whilst the main functions of the renal system include filtration, reabsorption, excretion, one of the other roles that it plays is in regu regulation of uh, blood pressure. How does it do this? So we essentially need a system that will enable us to detect the amount of filtration that's currently happening so that we can provide that feedback information up to then regulate future filtration that will happen all by regulating systemic blood pressure. The way we do this is by using the Juxta glomerular apparatus. And this is where it's located. So let's move on to the next slide now to clearly outline this area. Let's have a look at this section over here. It looks beautiful with all the renal corpuscles present and all the tubules around. I think maybe we'll move into this particular section over here. And with you can clearly outline what compartments of the juxtaglomerular apparatus we can see here. So we can clearly see this region here and these cells collectively are the specialized DCT cells um, that work with the patch of cells underlying them. And collectively, these cells are called the juxta glomerular apparatus or JGA. Now, I don't want you guys to worry too much about the specific names for these cells because that's beyond the scope of what you need to know. But the real purpose of the juxtaglomerular apparatus is to sense the levels of filtration that's happening and they can then secrete renin and are involved in the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system to eventually increase or decrease sodium reabsorption, which affects blood pressure and thereby affects the amount of filtration.